Welcome to the Porch Roof Classic, a retro baseball podcast novel in 15 or so episodes by Jeff Pullman. Episode 14. The phone call to Izzy the morning we left Mesquamacate was a little more relaxed than the one with Danny. God must be in the bleachers, he said. Can you hit? I don't think so, but I didn't think I could pitch either. Before we left Rhode Island, I did get to ride the big wheel with Robbie. He kept his eyes open and played some one-armed miniature golf with Mom and Dad, but everything else was foggy, and I was even too busy thinking about the Porch Roof Classic on the drive home to play Mustangs and Volkswagens. Helen had dragged one of our loungier porch chairs into the backyard and was sunning herself in center field, dressed in a long T-shirt when we got home that afternoon. "'Where's your Hollywood tan?' she asked. "'Oh, forgot. You were in Rhode Island.' "'Where's yours?' I pointed at her sunburned face. "'Don't get me going. Couldn't find any more lotion in the house, so I gave myself five minutes, which turned into a nap, and kaboom! Baked lobster!' I breathlessly told her about my new pitch discovery in Mesquamacut and that the game was back on, and she hopped out of her chair to hug me. Those bums are old meat now. Isn't that what you say in baseball lingo? Old meat? Something like that. How'd everything go here? asked Dad from the porch. Just fine, Phil. Mail kept coming and the grass kept growing. Actually, I mostly read and watch TV. Your favorite chair downstairs is now mine, too. He smiled and disappeared again. I asked Helen what she watched. Some cop show and a comedy about a family. The usual dreck. No news? No way. I was on vacation, same as you. I was about to bring up the Boston protest stuff again, but decided not to push it any further. Later, I took the garbage cans down to the curb for the Friday crack of dawn pickup. I was having a tough time keeping the lid down on one of them, so lifted its top and a flat box with empty Chinese takeout cartons spilled onto the garage floor from some place called Yu's Sichuan in East Springfield. That was strange. But when I asked Helen about them later, she just blushed, admitted she got a bad low main hankering once a month. I dropped it, seeing her diet and hankerings were none of my business, and because I was about to ask for her help with something else. I think we need to make a scoreboard for the game. Great idea! What kind? I found an illustrated book about the Red Sox and showed her Fenway's famous horizontal one on the green monster in left field. Isn't that a little big? Of course it is. It's just to give us an idea. We mined ideas for a few minutes and came up with a plan, which led me to haul an unused bulletin board up from the basement, ride my bike to the drug depot to buy 50 index cards and box of tacks, and create a mini version of the line score section of Fenway's board. Visitor team and home team were written with a fat marker across two taped-together cards, and we left nine spaces to the right to add run cards for each inning. Because I'll be scoring the game, I can tack up the scoreboard cards, too, said Helen. Yeah, except what if we need you to play? She snorted a laugh. Oh, you don't want me to play. Believe me, I'm very happy staying the brains of the outfit. Her brain worked all of Friday. She asked if my parents had any extra folding chairs, and the half dozen they kept on hand for occasional cookouts made their way into the right field corner, where they became an added seating section in case more fans showed up. Helen was concerned about people not being able to read the scoreboard through the porch screen, so we found a way to prop it up on the flat top bushes in front of the screen with the help of two coat hangers. Helen would just have to run out between half innings and put up each run total. The weather forecast for Saturday was partly sunny with little wind in the high 60s. Perfect. The only thing still imperfect was my right arm, and as soon as Dad got home from work and they saw their folding chairs set up in the corner of the yard, the game and my playing in it became the only topic at dinner. I'll be fine, Ma. With a broken wing? I don't think so. It isn't broken, it's sprained. I saw him throw the wiffle with that weird motion in Rhode Island, said Robbie, like five times. Whoosh, 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 and it didn't hurt him once. Mom frowned, wanting to believe, but also wanting to mother. One thing we don't need is another $25 for an emergency room visit, added Dad, keeping his usual priorities straight. Helen listened quietly, twirled the pasta on her fork, then loudly cleared her throat. 
just being an observer here because I'm your guest and all, but this seems to be about your fear of Joey doing more damage to his arm, right? Uh, right, said Dad. Okay, but we can't ignore Joey's passion for kicking Danny Blight's patootie and achieving a lot of self-respect. The way I figure, self-respect will last much longer than any more minor damage he might do to his arm. Dad turned to Mom for help, but she looked equally befuddled. He sighed through his teeth and took a belt of Schlitz. How about we have a compromise, he said, you know, like wise King Solomon. Joey gets to pitch and not bat. Hopefully you haven't tried to swing with that arm, too, said Mom. That isn't fair, yelped Robbie. What's fair is us allowing this game to be played at all, continued Dad. It's actually a damn miracle, if you ask me. Well, that's going to cut our offense down big time, I said. By my calculations, 34%, said Helen. Right, said Dad, but you haven't even swung the bat with that thing yet. If your pitching is now so much better, that should cut up their offense down a few rungs, too. He did have sort of a point there, but all that did was make one thing crystal clear. Everything would now ride on my delicate throwing arm. Anyway, continued Dad with a trickle of smirk, as part of the deal, let me test out that amazing arm of yours. I exchanged a stunned look with Helen. Come on, your old man's good for a few hacks, right? So we hit the backyard before sunset. Dad stood at the plate with Robbie at catcher and Helen out in the field and missed five of the six pitches I threw him with a pathetic golf-like uppercut. He connected on the last one, though, spanked it down the left field line, cried, Two bagger! and light jogged his way to second base, a pile of loose change jiggling in the pocket of his work slacks. Robbie was snoring like a hedge trimmer when Helen slipped into our room to say good night around midnight. I had trouble falling asleep and had been deep inside, pitching in a pinch for at least a half hour. That the book you were telling me about? she whispered. Yep. Listen to this. Luck is a combination of confidence and getting the breaks. The lucky man is the one who hits the nail on the head and not his fingers, and the ability to swat the nail on its receptive end is a combination of self-confidence and an aptitude for hammering. Okay, so just be confident and you'll get lucky? Seems pretty basic. Yeah, but it's in a chapter about baseball jinxes, like seeing a cross-eyed player can really screw you up. Yeah. I wouldn't rely on that book too much. I mean, the author's been kind of dead for a while. I just came in to say I believe in your arm, and I believe in you, and Danny Blight is just a piece of meat waiting to get cooked. Confidence from other people goes a long way, too. Yeah, I know. Thanks, Helen. She leaned over and gave me a short but real kiss. Turned out it was all I needed to fall asleep. Autumn said hello ahead of time. It was so windy and chilly when I biked to Irv's at 6 a.m. I had to wrap a scarf around half my face and twice nearly vaulted over curbs. I needed to make an early work entrance and get a few hours in before going home with my fake fever at 11.30. I also had to remind Tomas and Jesus about the game. Oh, I don't know, man, said Tomas, slapping a few butter pads on the grill for the first eggs of the day. Maybe we can come after we close, added Jesus. What, you mean 3.30? It'll probably be over. They shrugged in unison with guilty looks on their faces, which made me very distracted when I took counter orders. Irv was always in a decent mood on Saturdays after having a festive Sabbath Eve dinner the night before, so even when I put water on my face and neck around 11.15 and visibly slowed down, he wasn't too angry when I said I needed to leave. Helen had a little more trouble, sat customers for a few hours, then snorted a fingerful of pepper around 11.30 and sneezed on a guy coming in with a walker. Irv laid into her for that, forced her to recite a couple labor laws about employee health that Helen made up on the spot. She got to Squaw Farm Road a few minutes before noon and had to rush to set up her mathematical workshop on the back porch. Izzy and Jean were already there, chatty and excited and doubtedly nervous. How's that arm, Joey? Fine, for the sixth time. Robbie had gone back and forth about wanting to play for us, and I had gone back and forth, wondering if he should. He had his trusty and dusty Red Sox cap on and a little glove on his hand, but seemed to be more interested in sitting beside Helen on the porch to pour over her number sheets. Let's just see how the game goes, Robbie, I said. If anything, it might help us just to have a dedicated rooter in here. What the hell am I? asked Helen. Our math expert. 
All right. Well, the temperature is 71 degrees and the wind is blowing maybe three miles an hour toward the porch. So expect very little variance in your recent performances. You see? I think I should score the game, Robbie blurted and scooted back in the house to get his scorebook before I could even nod. Mom and Dad seemed as excited and jumpy as Robbie. Mom bought extra tuna cans for sandwiches just in case, while Dad sat in the dining chair closest to the window, smoked his pipe, and tried to read his Matt Helm novel while he glanced outside between paragraphs. Twelve noon became twelve ten, then twelve twenty, and Danny's team still hadn't shown up. Wussy bastard, said Gene as he paced near home plate. Five more minutes and they forfeit and that's that. Be nice if we had an umpire to enforce it, I said. As Izzy's wristwatch struck 1235, a double low rumble sounded from the front of the house. We moved around the side and saw two cars pull up and park on the street, one on each side of our driveway. Danny, Jamie Steger, and Jamie's equally annoying friend Cindy spilled out of the first car, while Mick, his stocky brother, and Stan and Dan from Chicopee exited the rear one. They carried three new black bats that looked as menacing as Izzy's black bonzo. They wore wristbands and high baseball socks and knee pads under their shorts. Danny had a snappy new Yankees cap on his head just to piss me off and wore black sun glare war paint under his cunning eyes. Jamie hung on his arm like a drapery while Sandy skipped in little dumb circles behind them and toted a giant plastic bag of popcorn. This where the massacre's at, barked Mick from inside his too tight, deep purple t-shirt that for some reason was red. Starting already, doofus, asked Jean. Plus you're late, said Izzy. We sure are, said Danny with an opening, hellacious grin, but fashionably so. Who's the home team, asked Stan or Dan. We'll flip a coin for that, I said. Uh Uh-uh, said Danny. We drove all the way over here to the sorrier side of town, so I think you guys deserve to be the home team. All right. Any ground rules we have to ignore? I pointed toward the high left field garage wall with a bat. Anything over that is a homer and you get an extra out. Cool, said Danny, already practicing his swing towards it. A ball on the front part of the porch is a double because it's so short, but if Robbie plays and hits it, we'll give him a homer, okay? Yeah, like that'll happen, said Mick. And if you hit one to right and it lands in the Bickerstein's bushes, it's also a ground rule double because we think there's poison ivy in there. Okay, said Danny, forced a yawn. As far as I can see, though, you don't have enough players to have someone at first base. Smells a little like a forfeit. Ha! cried Jean. No, same rules we had in the practice game, I said. On grounders, you throw to the pitcher for the out instead of first base. Unless you want to lend us one of your guys. You kidding? asked Izzy. He'll drop everything we throw at him. Fine, said Danny, and peered out at Helen, who glared at him from the back porch. See, you're keeping your cheerleader out of the way, which is nice. Robbie's the cheerleader. Helen has other things to do. Oh, I'm sure she does, har har. Shall we commence hostilities now? I wasn't sure what was more infuriating, having Danny's team in my backyard or having Danny talk like a pompous British duke. Either way, I took the field with Izzy and Jean and prepared to do battle. On Helen's advice, we decided that Izzy would pitch first to get them overconfident before I came in and hopefully blew them away. With my right arm out of its sling and dangling a little, I took shallow right field because less balls went there and it was a shorter heave to the pitcher. Gene parked himself and left between the porch and the garage wall. Izzy pumped himself up as he walked to the mound. And pitching for the Joeys, Izzy Drucker, he cried, causing cackles from our opponents. Helen darted out of the porch, tacked index cards for Danny's and Joey's on the left side of the scoreboard, and we were off. Lay one in there, Mother Drucker, said Mick as he stepped up to home plate. Izzy gave him a little old-fashioned wind-up none of us had ever seen before and floated one too much over the pie pan. Mick whacked the ball down the left field line where it bounced off the bottom of the garage wall and got him into second with a clean double. That was easy, said Danny. It's one batter, dork, said Gene whipped the ball back to Izzy. Mick's stocky brother, whose name I never learned, was next, and he sliced one on purpose in my direction. I got the ball in my glove, but the throw to the mound was a joke, hit the ground two feet in front of Izzy and bounded away. Mick scored easily, and we were already behind. And you think you're going to hit the ball with that thing? asked Danny. He pulled one batting glove out of his back pocket and tugged it onto his right hand. 
Oh, I didn't tell you, I replied. I'm not going to be a hitter, just an automatic pitcher later. Serious? Why didn't you bring that up in the ground rules? Because it's not a ground rule. It's just a roster rule. What do you care? One less batter for us, right? Danny shook his head, amused, and stepped up to the plate. Izzy and Jean suddenly looked beyond anxious, like they realized how much of a burden they had to carry. Danny stood up there with his regal stance, a lion ready to pounce on a gopher. Izzy floated a pitch in. Danny swung with his one arm and the ball vanished from sight. Robbie was already zooming to the front yard to retrieve it. That's a no doubt, and this looks like a rout, crowed Danny. Loped around the bases and made sure to catch my eye. Give up yet? I glared at him, spit into my glove because it seemed like the coolest way to reply. The Chicopee twins were next. Dan was a lefty and Dan a righty, meaning I had to switch fields with an annoyed Gene before two straight hitters. Each of them singled, and after Mick bounced one off Izzy's face, we were behind five to nothing. Mick's brother then hit into a strange double play because Ch Chicopee, too, wandered too far off second base on a ball head out to me. I slung it to Izzy, covering second, where he slapped the tag on Dan's heel. Danny made the third out when he blistered a ball to Gene on an invisible clothesline. His garage blast gifted them with a fourth out. I already regretted, but a Chicopee twin supplied it, and it was finally our turn to bat. Helen shuffled out from the porch with a dour face to tack a big five index card on the scoreboard. Gene hit first and was so pumped up, he dropped the bat twice, stepping in against Mick. Stan and Dan and Mick's brother took the outfield while Danny put himself at first base, an easier place to ridicule us from. What do we need for our forfeit? Nine, nothing lead, right? Shut the hell up, said Gene, and wiggled Black Bonzo around while Mick got ready to pitch. He fired one in. Gene swung so violently he missed, and the bat flew out of his hand and nearly scraped the garage wall, where Dan snatched it out of the air. One out, he yelled, whipped it back toward home while his team cracked up. Red-faced Gene grabbed the bat again, scooped up the nearest two handfuls of dirt he could locate, and caked it on the handle. He got back in. Swung even harder and popped the ball up to Mick for the real first out. Izzy was next, a bit more relaxed up there than Gene, and grounded one down the left field line for a double that got Helen and Robbie whooping out on the porch. Suddenly I had to make the decision. A two-person lineup with invisible men all over the bases just wasn't going to work. I checked to see if Mom or Dad were watching from a window, then picked up a bat and stepped toward the box. No way, barked Mick from the mound. You said you weren't going to hit. Five against two isn't really fair, you know, and since you won't lend us one of your guys, it's all we can do. No biggie, said Danny. Go ahead and destroy your arm again. When the ambulance gets here, we could take a nice break. Guffaws poured in from the outfield. Jamie and Cindy nearly giggled themselves to death. Helen flashed me a peace sign from the porch. I flexed my bad arm until I felt a bit of pain, then let it hang by my side and stepped into the left-handed box. The laughs and catcalls got even louder. I don't have any mathematics for you if you do this, shouted Helen. Forget the ambulance, said Mick's doofy brother. Someone call Ripley's, believe it or not. Just let him hit it, Mick, said Danny, and shook his head with a smirk. I squared my sneakers, raised the bat with my left hand, a mirror image of Danny's notorious one-armed stance. Mick reared back and looped in a high, slow, soft bell type pitch. I made myself forget I even had a right arm, hacked at the spinning plastic with my left. The ball sliced away from the mound. Mick got a bare hand on it, but it nicked off his thumb and died in the clumpy grass. I raced across the first base paper plate for a cheap single as Izzy scampered home with our first run. Ha ha! shrieked Jean, scrambled for Black Bonzo. Danny shoved his hip into mine twice while I stood on first, and I didn't even react. Jean and Izzy both popped out, but Helen tacked up the one for our side, which was some kind of triumph. Danny's will crack your backs! Danny's will crack your backs! shouted Jamie and Cindy in semi harmony from their chairs as we took the field again. Joey's never say noey! Joey's never say no he countered Robbie from the porch and pounded the table where he sat for added effect. I jogged halfway to the porch screen. Any more new math tips for us? I yelled, making sure all of the Dannys heard me. Uh, Mrs. After Swing Height and Butterfinger Factor both holding steady, and so is Controlled Inspiration Gauge. Got it. Thanks. 
Danny wasn't impressed, but Stan and Dan looked reasonably stupefied. I hurried back to right field, but got there two seconds after Izzy pitched, and Stan ripped the liner past where I stood for a ground rule double into the Bickerstein bushes. Damn it, Izzy, what the hell are you doing? I yelled. I thought you were ready. Did I look ready? There was no doubt about it. We were crumbling, and it was only the second inning. I waited for Mick to single Stan in and for Mick's brother to put one on the upper porch roof for an eight-to-one Danny's lead, and then I walked to the mound. I can get these guys out, said Izzy. When? Christmas? Give me the stupid ball. He made a fart sound with his mouth and dropped the ball in my glove. Look out, people, yelled Danny. The monster is coming in. I heard Robbie chuckle from the porch. He knew full well that the monster was Dick Raditz, a six foot six, two hundred thirty pound reliever for the Red Sox in the early sixties who struck people out for a living. I didn't exactly resemble him. I limbered up my right arm a bit, ignored little stabs of pain. The sun ducked behind clouds and a light breeze picked up, blew right to left as I faced home. Danny was up. Of course he was. I'd been dreading this moment for weeks, but at least now I had an unusual weapon I could deploy against him. I waited for the next little wind gust to come along, spread my fingers across two of the holes on the ball, dropped my arm and whipped the thing toward home. It played across the breeze, doing every dance but the mashed potato and curved away from him at the last moment. He missed it by a yard. Wait a damn minute, cried Mick and came running up to inspect the ball, then stare at me. Nothing's on it, Mick, I swear. Better hope not, yelled Danny. The next pitch curved in the opposite direction. Danny gave it a vicious swipe, but topped the ball. It skidded on the grass right past me for a cheap single, but I was elated. He hadn't made solid contact. We escaped that inning with just three runs being scored, then came back with three of our own, highlighted by an Izzy bomb atop the left center roof. It was eight to four them going to the third inning, but could have been far worse. My sidearm ball was even more bamboozly the next inning. Stan and Dan both looked bad, popping it up, and after Mick homered, a master of the art of cheap porch roof pokes, Danny homered to dead center. But it was a ball that Gene and Izzy both messed up on, and it skipped off the top of the fence there and dropped over. After we got three runs in the last of the third, it was 11-7, to seven, and Danny was annoyed. We should be murdering you nimrods. Which I guess makes you nimrods, right? returned Gene. The Dannys took this personally and scored once in the fourth on catching and throwing errors by Izzy that saw Mick scamper all the way around the bases. Danny then took over pitching duties and fired many blazing fastballs by us until Gene got a hold of one and lined it onto the deep roof for a solo shot. After he strutted around the bases and the inning ended, Helen came out and updated the line score with Robbie's help. Danny's 12, Joey's 8. The strong breeze died. My pitches took a break from their dance moves around then, and the Dannys piled up four more runs in the top of the fifth. Everyone hit the ball hard, and it was a miracle when Gene turned a double play on Stan when he caught Dan's liner and fired it to me on the mound to double off his brother. The score was suddenly 16-8. to We were getting hot and tired, and as we trudged back in toward home plate, Danny and Mick paused to smirk as they passed. Then someone let out a loud whistle from the side of the house. I couldn't believe it. Tomas and Jesus had arrived, both in jeans and ratty t-shirts. Jesus wore a faded pirate's cap. I ran up to slap hands with them. Never thought you'd make it. We told Irv it was Puerto Rican holiday. No customers by two o'clock anyway. Izzy and Jean ran over to meet them, shake hands. I don't think so, yelled Danny. Tough noogies, said Izzy. Tough noogies on toast, added Robbie from the porch. Yeah, I said, we've been outnumbered all day, and there's no rule that says people can't join the team in the middle of a game. Fine, barked Mick's brother. I'm going to call up my cousin in Vermont who played on a semi-pro team and could hit one to freaking Burlington. Go ahead, said Gene. Maybe his bus will get here in a day. Danny sighed, then held up his hands in an attempt to look wise. If Private Tosh insists on bending the rules once again to try and beat us, I say who cares? He could have Frank Robinson himself here, and it won't stop us from beating their asses. Danny may have spoken too soon. Tomas grabbed the skinny yellow bat, got up there first, and sizzled a low pitch to right center that landed in the Bickerstein bushes on the fly for a double. A Roberto hit, cried his brother, who got into the box and whacked the next pitch for a double down the left field line. These guys were scary hitters, and we were suddenly inspired. When the inning smoke cleared, we had nine runs on the board and a 17-16 to lead. 
Every member of the Dannys was cursing under his breath, and they took it out on us in the sixth, scoring three times on three mammoth homers by Danny, Dan, and Stan. Lunch is ready, boys, shouted Shirley Tosh from the kitchen window. Not yet, Mom, I yelled. We got three runs bite back and had a 20-19 to 19 lead through sixth. I'm hungry, announced Mick suddenly between innings. We all looked at each other. Sweaty, dirty, and equally famished, we silently greed to head for the porch. You've been listening to The Porch Roof Classic by Jeff Pullman. This retro baseball podcast novel was made possible by Spotify for Podcasters and Buzzsprout. Be sure to basket catch another episode next week. If you enjoyed this podcast and would like to contribute, go to buymeacoffee.com slash jpolman54v. Thanks.